grace, mercy, and peace from our Father in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Assistant Pastor Alfonso Ivey, and we want to welcome our G2GCC believers and our viewing audience. Before we get any further into this message, I want to go ahead and open us up in prayer. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for the word. We thank you for the incorruptible seed. We thank you for all those that are hearing. Lord, we just ask you that there's an anointing on the speaker to be able to deliver the word, and there's an anointing on the hearer, whether they are here live or whether they are getting this by recording. And we thank you for that anointing for the believer to hear. We thank you that power still goes forth unchanged because of your word has no distance, Lord God. We thank you that as people listen today, even where they are, where they, are they would be healed emotionally, physically, and in every other way. That blessings and favor would be abundant in their life just for having heard your word and being present with the anointing. And we thank you for that. Satan, we bind you from trying to steal any parts of this word in the name of Jesus, and we cast you out right now. Father God, I just say that I decrease so that you may increase. Holy Spirit, be revelatory as we go through this message and reveal all things, lead and guide these people which hear your word. For that, we give you praise, glory, and honor in the name of Jesus. And all who would agree with that say, Amen. Amen. All right, again, Assistant Pastor Ivy, and the title of this message is Kingdom Minded, Kingdom Minded. So go ahead and make sure you're taking notes, pull out your Bible or your devices, all of the above, and just be able to turn if we have some scriptures to turn to. Uh, again, Kingdom Minded is the title. The theme of this message is Kingdom. We just want to be able to talk about the kingdom, some of our other uh, assistant pastors and ministers have begun talking about kingdom, and we're going to continue in that theme. So again, kingdom-minded, our foundation scripture, scripture is Matthew 10, 7, and another passage, 1 Corinthians 2, 2. Again, that's Matthew 10, 7, and 1 Corinthians 2, 2, which we'll turn there shortly. The purpose of this message, you can kind of write it down however you like and extract uh, whatever you take from my sentence, but I'll give it to you as bland as possible first. That is to help believers align our minds with the Word of God as it relates to kingdom thinking. To help believers align our minds with the Word of God as it relates to kingdom thinking. I just want to be able to help you all, uh, help us as believers uh, partake of the word and line up our minds, our thinking in such a way where it is consistent and balanced in God's word so that his fullness and his power would flow forth through you. Uh, we want it to be where there's an anointing on everything you think, believe, and do. And we do that by lining up the word with God. And so I believe because we've prayed for revelation and you're in the spirit of expectancy, you will receive something that you may have never heard before. And what you have heard uh, faith comes by hearing, and so it'll simply be reinforced. Our goal, we're only going to, well, actually, I have two goals. So uh, the, the primary goal is to help believers understand that the doorway to Christ's kingdom, that's possessive, Christ's kingdom is through Christ's cross. Again, possessive, Christ's cross through the cross of Christ, however you want to put that. So to help the believers, that's you, understand that the doorway to Christ's kingdom is through Christ's cross. Uh, you may have heard me say, no cross, no crown. So it's difficult to think about kingdom thinking when we're not even thinking about how that kingdom begins. And so that in itself is a revelation for you. Uh, second goal and objective is to help the believer adjust their beliefs and operate in understanding authority and power. One more time, to help believers adjust, make an adjustment to their beliefs and operate in understanding authority and power. And so, um, before I introduce the message any further, I'll just tell you it's really only one main point. It's a long main point, but just one main point. And that main point is going to be we must align our thinking with biblical 
slash kingdom principles. We must align our thinking with biblical slash kingdom principles. Then I'll give you a summary and we will close. And that, that's pretty much what I'm going to tell you. So now I'm going to tell you what, what I'm supposed to tell you. All right. So in introducing this message, the story of the Bible, it's about a king. You know who that king is, a kingdom and the king's kids. That means, well, not that means, but I'm going to say the means by which it's possible is through the cross. So again, the, the whole story about the Bible is about a king. We're talking about Jesus, Jesus Christ, a kingdom and the king's kids. Uh, you have that right to be a kid or a child of God rather than just a creation of God when you're born again. And so this is uh, for the believers and all who want to be in this kingdom. Jesus has provided a way for that to take place. So, again, the means by which it's possible is, is through the king's sacrifice as Jesus's sacrifice via the cross so that all could partake of the kingdom and its benefits. So. I want you to just be able to meditate on just that before we even get to any of the scriptures because it gives you an idea of where this message is going or the order or the alignment of how we should be thinking. The story of the Bible is a story about a king, a kingdom, and the king's kids. The means by which it is possible is through the king's sacrifice via the cross so that all could partake of the kingdom and its benefits. And so, now you know where we're going. So we're going to go into our first main point. Again, it is we must align our thinking with biblical slash kingdom principles. And so you already got the foundation scripture. I want you to be able to turn in and I'm going to go ahead and read both of those before I proceed. So the first one is, is Matthew 10, 7. And let me, I'm going to get both of them open up in my Bible so I can kind of go back and forth. And if you have your devices, you can kind of use both of those too. Sometimes it's good to be able to turn the pages so you remember where you're going. And sometimes use your devices or all of the above. So Matthew 10, 7 says, and as ye go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As you go, preach, that means to proclaim Yell it, shout it, say it over and over again, profess it, confess it, take it with you. Um, almost as if you, if you heard uh, in, in some of those old movies, the town crier uh, with, with an alert, almost as if you're running through the streets proclaiming this truth. So again, as you go, you go your way or go ye into all nations, preach or proclaim saying the kingdom of heaven is at Hand. Now let's look at our second uh, foundation scripture, which is 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. So Jesus said to his followers, preach or proclaim the gospel. So he's saying, take this message. But then we have here, oh, New Testament and 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why was he saying that? Well, if we look back in verse, uh, verse two, I mean, verse one, Paul says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellence, excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, what does that mean? I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus or Christ and him crucified. We use that scripture a bunch, but why is Paul saying it? So that's one of the ways you want to be able to study the Bible. Paul is an excellent orator, and so he always builds a case. It's kind of like if you're listening to me and you just catch me right in the middle of the story, you're not going to get it because my message is always building. So for Paul, it's critical that you read what's happening before, what's happening after, maybe that chapter at least, but if nothing else, uh, the verses around it. I would suggest read the, the whole chapter, a couple chapters around it before because he's building up a case. Uh, he's not trying to build a whole doctrine right there, but what he's trying to do is say, I'm keeping it simple. 
because y'all been messing up and taking things so far out of order, all I'm telling you is I'm not speaking with this excellence uh, speech or man's wisdom or some other doctrine. I'm keeping it very simple. The first and foremost, the primary thing that you need to know is Christ and him crucified. And, and that's what that meant. Now, it doesn't mean stay right there because we're not going to operate in kingdom if the only thing we do is just believe Christ and him crucified. We have to build upon that, but that is our anchor. So again, now you have a clue as to where this message is going. What's kingdom thinking? Our anchor must be right there in Christ crucified. And so that's why these two foundation scriptures again, go and preach the kingdom, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Paul saying, I know nothing except Christ and Christ crucified. Why? Again, because I'm wanna, I want to keep it simple for you. Because in just a, a few short months, a few short years, you've went astray with all type of doctrine. So let's just stay right there. All right. So now when we look at the foundation scripture, I want to look at one of the words in there. So uh, that first foundation scripture, Matthew 10, 7. So again, it says, and ye go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when we look at the word kingdom, it's going to be Basilea or Basilea. Nine, that's 932 in the Strongs. So in Greek, again, Basilea, and that's kingdom. What it means is kingship, sovereignty, authority, rule, and I'll sum it up for you after this, uh, especially of God, both in the world and in the hearts of men. So again, kingship, sovereignty, authority, rule, especially of God, both in the world and in the hearts of men. Now, let me give you a second definition before I do any summarizing of that. So behind that Greek word for kingdom, Basilea, lies some Aramaic. So you got to study a little bit further to see how this word break down, breaks down. Uh, further than the Greek or either what influenced this word. So a lot of times you'll see in your study tools in your Strong's Concordance other, other words that was de that particular word was derived from. And so you can kind of keep tracing it back or you can pull other tools in. But again, that word in the Greek, we got it, the kingship and such. But in Aramaic, the term is malkut, M-A-L-K-U-T which Jesus may have used at that time, but Malkut refers primarily not to a geographical area or a realm, nor to the people inhabiting the realm, but rather to the activity of the king himself, his exercise of sovereign power. And so that's critical to know because even though Jesus was telling them, preach the kingdom, they didn't have a good idea of what the kingdom was. Otherwise, he wouldn't have to keep explaining, it's, it's near you. The kingdom is in the midst. They were confused at that leading up to it. They were still trying to figure these things out. He had not even gone to the cross yet. And so, again, I'll just I'll go back through that. The Greek word for kingdom, Basilea, lies the Aramaic term Malkut, which Jesus may have used. Malkut refers primarily to not a geographical area, or a ram, nor to the people inhabiting the ram, but rather to the activity of the king himself, his exercise of sovereign power. It's good to know that because when we look at other scriptures, uh, you got to think the same way that the disciples would have needed to think in that, in that time, which is when we say kingdom, we're not saying over here, over there, but we're talking about a place within you, and that is because there is a king. And so we'll go a little bit further and see if we can bear that out. Let's look at the next verse after verse 7, which is verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, and freely you shall give. So kingdom living, we got clues there. Kingdom living means that action is taking place. And again, this is right now, I'm not coming from the Strong's Concordance. I'm just coming from the definitions he's given me. 
and trying to determine, well, what are you telling me the kingdom is? So kingdom living means that action is taking place, miracles are taking place, believers are operating under the authority of the king, king's name, so that's in Jesus' name, and power is going forward rather than just words. So power is going forward. And so the things that you hope for in all of your churches and in your homes without just getting into magic, diabolical stuff and witchcraft and such, we're hoping, we're trying to believe by faith and get to a place where we're, we are aligned with God so that we're operating in that anointing, that miracle working power, or the Bible would call it dunamis power. There's exousia and then there's a, a dunamis power when you see the word power in the Bible, it's usually one of those two words. Well, to get to that miracle working power, we have to understand that there's some authority that comes before the power goes out. And so that has to be in, in alignment. And so part of that is, is, is knowing this. So again, uh, kingdom living means that action is taking place, not just a bunch of words. Miracles are taking place. Believers are operating under the authority, that word I said, for under the king of the king in the king's name they're going forth in the king's name so when i went to different countries overseas we stepped out as ambassadors of the united states wherever our ship was parked became that became part of the united states just by territory and when we stepped away from that we were still um, our identity was linked to the ship even though we were going out we were always linked as united states citizens no matter where and we were ambassadors to the king and so again, everything we do as kingdom, as believers, or kingdom, kingdom citizens, we do it under the authority of the king, in the king's name, power goes forth and anointing goes forth, amen? All right, so now let's look at the next part of that, that verse seven. And as ye preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, at hand. What does that mean? Well, I looked up the word at hand or that term at hand. Uh, we get the phrase or the, the word egizo, uh, that's E-G-I-Z-Z-O, that's 1448 in the Strong's. And what it means is to make near or to come near, to approach. Now, it's, to me, it's very simple when you look it up, but believe it or not, this is, you know, we have different things where uh, as Christians, we have not come into the unity of the faith as God would have us, but these, this is one of the areas where we have doctrinal discord. Just like there's doctrinal discord when it comes to Holy Spirit, this is another area where Christians tend to infight on, did Jesus mean it was already there or not? And it seems pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but I, I do know how uh, the infighting began because it's in a, in a tense or mood, the particular word that could suggest it's already here. But I don't, I don't think that's what Jesus was saying at all because scriptures continue to bear that out. He's saying just what you would find in your strong concordance, which is to make near, to come, or to approach. So when, it's, when they say the kingdom is at hand, you know, why would Jesus, Jesus tell them to preach? And as you go saying the kingdom is at hand or the kingdom is approaching, the kingdom is near. And see, the way the word is written it's, it's the type of near where it's extremely close. If you look it up, you'll find that. And so extremely close, meaning it's, it's basically here. Why? Because the king is here. I just haven't done what it is I was supposed to be doing. So when we preach nowadays, when we go forth and proclaim, we shouldn't really be saying, repent, the kingdom is at hand. No, the kingdom is here. So I had to point that out because he had not yet gone to the cross. He had to tell them to say it from that perspective at, at that time. So that's, that's a little, digging a little bit deeper into that foundation scripture. Again, Jesus had not yet gone to the cross. So I'll make a statement. And one of those statements I put in, in, in highlighted myself so I wouldn't forget it. I can't be kingdom minded if I don't put the cross before the crown. We can't skip that part. It has to be Jesus in this sacrifice and I'm still of the belief that even in my own ministry, if we would teach very exclusively and specifically about the Levitical sacrifices, and I know that's Old Testament, all of us would get a greater understanding about the once and for all sacrifice that Jesus made. I think great revelation will come 
um, as far as the whole New Testament, uh, the blood of Jesus, the power of Jesus, and that sacrifice. And so when we think about him crucified, we have to think about it as a sacrifice. He was not murdered. He willingly laid down his life, and it was the once and for all, the final, it was the big one, that sacrifice. Amen? So I hope that is some revelation for you. Uh, let's turn to John 12, 32. John 12, 32. Again, if you got your devices, turn uh, click on your devices and get there. And if you got your Bibles, just click, you can come on over with me. And John 12, 32. As we get closer toward the end and time is running, I may go through some of these scriptures uh, with you uh, before you have to turn there. Again, John 12, 32, you should be there by now. And it says, well, you know what, I'll read it right off of here. And... Let me back. I'm going to back up to verse 30. Jesus answered and said, I mean, you can still put in your notes just uh, 32, but Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, uh, this, the, the thundering voice, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. So he's talking about the devil who had the keys, who is called the God of this world, the devil. And, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And what did he mean by it? Verse 33 explains it. This, he said, signifying what death he should die. And so, again, he should be lifted up. He's talking about the cross. And so we got to keep that squarely before us at all times. Uh, let's look at John 3, 14. And we're just going to second that. John 3, 14. And I'll give you just a moment to get there. But again, all we're going to do is reiterate that Jesus has to, that there has to be a cross before the crown. And I say that, giving you time to, to, to turn there, uh, John 3, 14. I say it because sometimes we put things out of order in the body of Christ. And I, I just really don't think it's God's heart to have so much division we talk, Baptists talk about non-denominational, non-denominational, talk about African-American, uh, the AME, I'm messing it up, <laughs> but African Methodist Episcopalian. But we, we, we tend to do divisive things and have divisive doctrines, but God is a, is a God of unity. And Jesus, just as much as people will be divided when they get it wrong, but if they would just receive the word, they would actually be unified. So it can be both of those things, but it's all about how you're receiving. And again, Jesus went to that cross. So John 3, 14, just as Moses is lifted up, lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must, that's a must, be lifted up. So he has to go to that instrument that people call an instrument of death or instrument of punishment. He had to go through it. That's also just your own revelation is certain punishment that we go through. We don't have to just accept that as God must be punishing me and sending me through it. No, Jesus is sending. Jesus did some things to reverse that type of punishment that's coming from the devil. Now, you may go through some things in life, but when it comes to just going through what the devil, how the devil is tormenting you and what he means, then he came to destroy the works of the devil. So let's look at uh, the next scripture, John 12, 24. John 12, 24. Not too, too much further from where we were at first. I'll go ahead and, and read that. Uh, again, talking about his death. Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. We're talking about a seed. It abideth alone, but if I die, I bring it forth much fruit. So just focus in there. Again, he's saying, if I die, I'm just like a seed. I'll be buried, but that seed is, is going to draw a harvest. So again, when he says, if I be lifted up, I draw all man. In this same context, he says, if I be buried like a seed, I'm going to have a fruit. I'm going to produce a harvest. It's going to be inevitable. And so that is, is what that scripture is talking about when we keep it in, in the, the greater context of, of this message. So let's go to John 16, John chapter 16. Again, 
We're trying to keep these things in order. What does it have to do with the kingdom? Because God has order. That's, that's true in the kingdom too. There's even an order to how we believe and what we believe. You know, I'll give you another example. Sometimes we'll put the cart before the horse. That means, again, we have all these different doctrines that have divided up the, up the church. And a lot of times it's us, the believers ourselves, choosing which message we're going to hear. But it's the whole Bible, what we're supposed to be hearing and what God's heart is on the matter. We don't have to be divided in, in these areas. So again, what did I say? John 16, uh, chapter 6, and we'll look at, I said John 16, verse 6, not chapter. Uh, we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So again, we're talking about a coming kingdom at this point. We're talking about the king, you know, that's the spoiler alert. The king is going to be in you. The kingdom is going to be in you. But he says, if, if I don't go away, if I don't do this thing, if I'm not buried, if I'm not planted as a seed, I can't have the harvest. It's just me on the earth, and then we're all in trouble if it's just me. But what if we're multiplied? What if it's duplicated? What if it's, it's a whole system, a whole network of us, an organization of us, a living God in us, within us? Amen? So again, if I don't go away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. If I don't go away, how does the kingdom go into kingdom. How, how do we get there if Jesus did not do what he did? So that was John six, verses six, chapter 16, verses 6 through 7. Let's look at seven, Luke 17, uh, 21. Luke 17, 21. I'll leave that there and flip over. Luke chapter 17, and we're going to look at verse... 21. I'll go ahead and read. I'll back it up to 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, or lo, there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So again, we're leading up to where the kingdom, you know, just in quick review, we talked about, so what should it look like? If he's saying, go and preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand, I already said, okay, well, that means extremely close, it's near. So then he says, I got to be buried, I got to be planted, I'm going to draw a harvest. If I be lifted up by this instrument of what they meant to be punishment, then something good is going to happen. And later on in my word, you'll hear, uh, I want to say 1 John 3, 8, where it talks about, I come just for this purpose, that I would destroy the works of the devil. We're well, just kind of thinking about that. Again, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but thinking about that. I always say that word destroy there means, it's a Greek word, luo, but it means to totally undo. To totally undo, almost as if I'm reversing. Think about a movie rewinding to say, I'm going to literally erase every part of what you did, what the devil did. And so if that means I have to go back and die the death that men were supposed to, buy, to die, I'll do that. If that means I have to reverse the cross, see, the cross is meant to be an instrument of death or punishment. I'm going to reverse it and it's going to become an instrument of life through death. And so... That's how the enemy works. You got to understand, uh, you know, I like the song that the young lady sang when it says, if the devil says I am that, I'm not that. If the devil says I'm not that, I am that. Because he's always trying to turn it inside out, upside down, reverse whatever God has, has done. He tries to pervert or turn, turn it out. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, a recent concert, think about it, just veering off for just a moment, of a, of a rapper named Travis Scott. And uh, it actually, when you zoomed out, it had an image of the stage, which was like an upside down cross. 
And so again, when we think about the, and eight people died, well actually a ninth victim died, um, but when we think about it, Jesus was undoing everything that the devil meant for bad, he was reversing that, amen? And so again, uh, Luke 17, 21, don't say it's over here or it's over there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. That's if you're a believer. The kingdom of God is within you. Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is going to be in you. Why? Because he said, I go away, but I'm going to send another confidence. I got to go away. I can't send me. I can't send God the Holy Spirit if God the Son does not be planted and be lifted up as been prophesied and as according to the scripture. Okay, let's look at uh, the next thought, the next revelation. Jesus Christ, and these are just some things to be able to jot down, even if we don't get to all these scriptures today, um, which we likely will not, but I want you to be able to have these concepts. So the very first concept, matter of fact, you can write them down is that. I'll give you the, the three or four of them first, and then we'll come back and do some scriptures. First concept is this. Jesus Christ is the source of all things that we receive. That is the first concept. Jesus Christ is the source of all things that we receive. So we talk about kingdom. Be kingdom minded. Live up to your kingdom rights. Remember, Jesus Christ is the source of all things that we receive. Uh, number two, the sacrifice of the cross is the means and the only means by which all of these things are given unto us. The sacrifice. I, I like to use the word sacrifice on the cross is the means and the only means by which all of these things are given unto us. What things? Well, again, I don't have it here, but God is just revealing to me right now to speak it. Uh, Matthew 6, 33. I always say, seek the king, not the things. Well, Matthew 6, 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom. So he's saying, seek that first, get that in order first, seek the kingdom, seek the king, because it's the king's kingdom, and then you ain't even got to worry. I'll add these other things to you. Don't go chase the money. Come, come find me. I'll get the money if I own the, the, the cattle on a thousand hills, if I own the earth and the fullness thereof. Chase me, seek me, and all these things will be added. So again, that's what I, what I mean there. The sacrifice on the cross is the means and the only means by which all of these things are given unto us. No other doctrinal beliefs should be justified. Number three, the third thing, with our Lord as the source, with our Lord as the source, the cross as the means or how did it happen? The cross is the means. Our epicenter of our faith must remain there. I'll say that again. Maybe I'll put the commas in there for you. With our Lord as the source, comma, the cross as the means, comma, our epicenter of our faith must remain there. What do I mean by epicenter? Epicenter is the nucleus. It's the central most point. So when I say the epicenter, usually is a word you, you hear with earthquakes are great power. So the epicenter of all that we believe must remain right there. That is the very central most point. All other things flow out from it. Even if Holy Spirit wants to operate in your life, he's always going to point you back to the cross and that sacrifice because what the things that you get, the kingdom that you're operating in does not exist without that. And so even if, if Holy Spirit needs to correct you, he'll come back and say, hey, put that first. Put that first. I don't, I'm just not this powerful slot machine, Holy Spirit, to come give you a bunch of stuff and lead you and guide you. First, I'm leading you to all truth. But Jesus say, I'm the truth. And so I got to lead you back there. I got to lead you back to where your faith ought to be centered in. I can't have you just saying, I confess this and I, I have it. I name this and I claim this. No, you believe, then you speak. But what should you believe? You should believe that Jesus is the sacrifice that makes all things possible. He is the source. So again, with, the, the, with our Lord as the source, the cross as the means, our epicenter of our faith must remain there. And the very last one, Holy Spirit works within the boundaries of Christ and him crucified. Holy Spirit works within the boundaries of Christ and him crucified. Again, just reiterating really what I already said. I'll give you some scriptures with that before we leave. 
but he works within the boundaries. What, what it is is to get you back in check if you're believing some things that is not supposed to be there. So you want to operate with this anointing and under power. You do that because you put, you, he'll send you back to why do you have this power in the first place? You, you, if you go around saying, I'm a kingdom citizen, how? What does that mean? What, do you, what, what proper thinking do you have to uh, indicate that you are a kingdom citizen? See, we used to actually memorize the entire chain of command when I was in the Navy. That means we had to go from the lowest person, Secretary of Defense, all the way up to the president. And so in this same manner, simply knowing where does the authority come from? Because if I don't know where the authority comes from, how am I even operating in the power? What power am I operating in exactly? Am I operating in, in demonic things, talismans around my neck, uh, dream catchers in the car? What things am I operating under? Am I operating under spells? And so that's why we have to be able to get it because sometimes we may be operating in, under spells or some things that is just not of Christ. You know, I can, I can play around and say, well, I'm an Aquarius, and most of us Aquarius just think the same way. Am I operating under the things of God, though? The Word. So the Holy Spirit wants to always focus you back in on Jesus. Amen. So let me give you a couple scriptures, but I want you to remain with me because uh, we're going to pick it back up on the next lesson. But with those four points I just gave you, I want to give you some scriptures. So I said Jesus Christ is the source of all things that we receive. Number two, the sacrifice on the cross is the means and the only means by which all of these things are given unto us. Number three, with, with our Lord as the source, the cross as the means, our epicenter of our faith must remain there. And number four, Holy Spirit works within the boundaries of, the, of Christ and Him crucified. So the scriptures with that is this. That first one I say, Jesus Christ is the source of all things that we receive. Put down John 1, 1, also verse 14, and verse 29. I want you to also put down John 14, 6, and I'm going to read that you can, so you can hear it, but you can just keep writing. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Because again, we said Jesus Christ is the source of all things we receive. Um, next scripture, John 14, 20, and we're coming to a close here, coming to a close. You write it. And listen, listen to me. So you get to hear the word. At that day, ye shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. So that's John 14, 20. Again, he's the source of all things we receive. And then finally, Colossians 2, 10 through 15. I won't read that one. Maybe we'll go over it next time. Colossians 2, uh, 10 through 15. And now, a couple scriptures with that second point. The sacrifice on the cross is the means and the only means by which all of these things are given unto us. Write down Romans 6, 1 through 14. Definitely not going to read all that today, but I want you to be able to reference it when we, when we come back to it. And you'll know what these, what these scriptures are uh, referring to, which points. Galatians 6, 14. I'll read that one for you. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory except in the cross, or it says save, but except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. What are we talking about? The sacrifice on the cross is the means and the only means by which all of these things are given to us. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I might be off. No, no, I'm right. That's right. All right. Now, go a little bit further with some other scriptures. So up under the point where I said, with our Lord as the source, the cross as the means, our epicenter of our faith must remain there. Write down the scripture, 1 Corinthians 17. It's 1, in fact, 1 Corinthians 1, 17, 18, and 23. Almost there, promise. Uh, first, no, you heard that before. First Corinthians 2, 2, first Corinthians 2, 2, for I determined 
not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Again, that's our, our anchor, our central most point of what we believe if we're going to be operating in kingdom thinking. So again, 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. Um, give you a couple more scriptures and then we're, we're done. Uh, I already mentioned 1 John 3.8 which again, it, it talks about he that committed sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil or undo all these works. So it becomes very critical that we understand the undoing process, understand where faith or who faith is in as we begin to apply faith. If I just stretch forth my hands and say, this is on me or my faith or my confession, I have to believe in something a little bit more than just my confession. Why am I confessing what I'm confessing? It's because I believe who I believe and what that means. I believe what the kingdom represents. I believe in healing. Signs shall follow them that believe. These are kingdom principles and kingdom benefits and kingdom alignment, but I have to be in alignment myself. And so these final scriptures that go up under uh, Holy Spirit works within the boundaries of Christ and him crucified. I'll write down Romans 8, 1 through 14, Ephesians 2, 13 through 18, and that's, that's it on those two scriptures. Romans 8, 1 through 14, Ephesians 2, 13 through 18, and I'll say this. He always points you back to the sacrifice if you're not placing that first. Holy Spirit always points you back. What does the word say? Hmm. Always points you back. So again, I'll go ahead and summarize with this. Gave you a lot of scriptures there toward the end because that is a precursor to what we'll be going over next time. But the summary, I'll keep it brief in just a sentence. This is what God said to me. I, I asked, I was like, how, how do I summarize all of this? And, and part of it was just being able to say, keep your thinking correct, keep your faith centered on the proper thing, the epicenter or the object of your faith, Jesus Christ and him crucified, then understand that yes, kingdom is within you because I went away so that I could come and spread in all men so this kingdom can now begin to spread. I know that. So what else would you have me to say in a nutshell, Lord? And he says this, kingdom applied has to come from kingdom inside and kingdom inside only comes from kingdom the king crucified. I repeat that. The summary, kingdom applied as operating in kingdom principles, applying kingdom principles. Kingdom applied has to come from kingdom inside and only from the king crucified. Kingdom applied has to come from kingdom inside and kingdom inside only comes from the king crucified. All right. Well, that is my time, and I hope to see you back on the next message. Uh, what I want to do before we close this out completely is I want to offer you the opportunity. If you're not saved, if you have not given your life to Jesus, I say it, seek the king before you seek the things, you know, uh, just being able to give your life to God. Give your life to God so that you are operating under kingdom principles, that you have kingdom life. The, the first and foremost thing is eternal life. That is the best gift that uh, exceeds any of the earthly things or material things. So go ahead and follow me in this prayer. If you have not given your life to Jesus, you want to be born again. You want to be a child of God. You want to be one of the king's kids, not just creation of God. Uh, repeat this prayer with me. Uh, Dear God in heaven. I come to you in the name of Jesus. You said in your word, whoever comes to you, you will in no way cast out. So I know that you won't cast me out, but you take me in and I thank you for it. You let me know in your word, Romans 10 verses nine and 10, that if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, I would be saved. I confess with my mouth because I believe in my heart. Jesus is the son of God. 
He died for my sins. He was raised from the dead for my justification. And I receive him right now as my Lord and Savior. You also said in your word, if I would ask for the Holy Spirit, you would give him to me. I'm asking you now to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you and I, I just give you glory for saving me and filling me with your precious Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen. I'll say a benediction prayer. Before, before that, I just want you to notice the numbers, the information on the screen. Let us know that if you gave your life to Jesus so that we can rejoice with you. Uh, you can find us at g2gcc.org, out on our YouTube page, or Facebook. Come and check us out. Um, again, I'm Assistant Pastor Ivy, and I'll pray this benediction prayer. Father, we just thank you for all those that heard the word today, that the word did not fall on deaf ears, but the word fall, fell on good ground. I thank you that that word would come to a full harvest, that they would, it would be fruitful. I thank you for lives being saved and changed. I thank you that because the king was crucified, now the king and the kingdom can be inside. I thank you for it, Father. I thank you that they received that revelation in the name of Jesus. And so all that are listening, all that are here uh, with us, I pray no hurt, harm, or danger will come nigh you, that you have favor, and this is the most blessed week of your life. In the name of Jesus, amen.